All right, thank you, Kelly. Uh, yes, all, hello, good morning, virtually. Uh, Matt Rich from MidPen Legal Services. I have with me Dan Vitek from CJP. He's gonna be uh, jumping in here. I'm gonna tag him in shortly, but I'm gonna lead us off here today. Uh, again, this is defending evictions from manufactured home communities. This is a little fireside chat with Matt and Dan here. Um, the uh, intention here is for this session to be a beginner to, um, to kind of moderate level uh, presentation for those of you who have sat in on some of the manufactured home sessions in the past, the plan conferences, this, some of this may look familiar. Um, we have added some things to it, but by and large, especially I see Don Meritz is on, and there may be some others who had, had uh, created the early iterations uh, of this presentation that's now been recycled over the years, but we have added a couple of things. Um, so Dan, I'll go ahead and move us along then. If you're yeah, let me just there. say, um, Shout out to some of the big names I see that are watching this presentation. It is an introductory presentation, but um, you know anything we don't cover, or if you can suggest things in the chat box, that's very helpful, um, I'm sure, to the people who are not as familiar with this subject matter. And we do have a good many things on here, so we are going to try and just cram them all in here before we run out of time. So we will push the questions in, but we'll try to get to as many of them as we can, either through responding in the chat or by answering them at the end here. So first going to start off with just some introductory things to keep in mind, which I, I think, um, as Dan and I have been talking about this, I know for my purposes anyway, as someone who, you know, I, I kind of waded into manufactured home stuff and, and was just kind of picking up cases as I was going along doing you know, kind of run of the mill landlord tenant stuff. I think it's good to have in mind some general concepts about manufactured homes and like themes, right? That you can then keep in mind as you're working through, because I do think they, they circle back around as you get into like down into the weeds, dealing with some issues involving manufactured homes. And so I'm going to mention some things up front here, and then you'll probably hear me um, circle back to them later. So uh, first, understand this is a significant source of kind of naturally occurring affordable housing rights. So this isn't affordable housing that we're necessarily like dependent upon the government to create in some form or fashion. Um, this is, you know, private manufactured housing. And in, in the U.S., we have approximately 18 people, 18 million people live in manufactured home communities uh, and manufactured homes. In Pennsylvania, manufactured homes comprise approximately 11 percent of the housing stock, especially in rural Pennsylvania. Um, this is the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing in the United States, right? I mean, typically when we think of affordable housing, we think of housing that's subsidized by the government, either through HUD or through the LIHTC program. But here, this is the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing. Um, and, and as far as affordability is concerned, the rent's less on average than site-built housing. Uh, however, as Dan's going to talk about when we get to taxes, uh, but one third of residents who own mobile homes have debt on their dwelling in one form or another. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, a manufactured home is, a, is technically a vehicle, right? So we think of it as a home, it's called a home, right? It's a manufactured home, but it is titled as a vehicle. There is not a deed to a manufactured home. Again, keeping in mind, this is personal property this is not real property. I think that becomes important. We have a slide later about rent to own agreements that you might encounter with manufactured homes. I think it's important to know up front and to keep in mind that we're dealing with personal property titled as a vehicle with a VIN number, uh, not real property like we would traditionally think of stick built housing. Um, again, certificate of title, which is issued by PennDOT. An individual can file requests with PennDOT to get either a duplicate title or to confirm who has title. Um, sale or transfer of titles done through an authorized PennDOT agent there. There's the, the, the basis for that. I think one thing that Dan and I talked about and one thing that I've learned kind of the hard way over the years is I think one of the first questions that you need to ask a client that you encounter when you're dealing with a manufactured home is are they indeed the title owner of the property if they are, do they actually have the physical title? That be, can become important, right? I, I'll briefly mention a case that I had one time where my client, I had asked her, you know, what were you, are you the title owner? And she did indeed was the title owner, did have a title. Um, and we ended up working out an agreement where she was going to transfer the title to the park owner. And by the time we got to that, I found that her physical title was actually in a safe to which she had lost her key. And so we held up this deal for about a month while she scraped together the money to get a locksmith out to get the safe open so we could actually get the physical title 
um, and didn't have to go through dealing with a duplicate, et cetera. So again, upfront, I think one of the first things to understand, not real property, and then also recall and remind yourself that you should be asking, uh, is your client the actual title owner and do they have the physical title? Yeah, it's not directly related to evictions, but we should understand when we're working with clients who live in a mobile home that the proper way to transfer ownership and title is to go through a PennDOT authorized agent. Um, you're going to see a lot of different concepts of ownership when it comes to these homes from someone who actually has the title in their name and in their possession uh, all the way to someone who just has been living there for a long time and has no idea who has title. Um, you'll also see, um, you know, sometimes the owner of the park has it. Um, you know, you'll see bills of sale, but the official transfer happens uh, through PennDOT. Yeah. yeah, again, keeping in mind that I, I think a good number of these deals get done on a handshake and a smile, perhaps, or off a of Craigslist or something. So these are not our typical transfer of ownership uh, transactions that we're used to, to thinking about when we think about like transferring real estate, per se, uh, perhaps. Um, again, keeping in mind, manufactured homes are taxed as real estate. Um, so the owner of the manufactured home is responsible for paying real estate taxes, which you know assessed by county, school district, and municipality. When the, the title is transferred, the new owner has to inform or should be informing the county assess county's assessment office so that he or she will get the tax notices, will get the bills, and will be able to pay what's owed uh, on taxes. Um, and if the owner fails to pay, then the tax claim bureau will eventually put the home up for tax sale. Um, there is extensive case law on challenging tax sales. Um, understand that most of the homes that go up for tax sale for one reason or another do not sell. And typically they instead end up back in trust with the tax claim bureau. But I know for my purposes, again, the first couple of years I was doing manufactured home cases didn't really dive too deeply into them. Um, I think up front, I didn't really understand fully the concept of the owner of the mobile home being taxed on the, the value of the mobile home uh, in addition to the owner of the property, the park owner um, being taxed for the actual land itself. So something else to, to keep in mind here. Again, uh, this is a big thing that's come up uh, over the years and I think was in large part uh, a driving force behind uh, recent changes to the statute, especially with the, the vernacular and the, the uh, name of the statute that we're gonna get to shortly, uh, is that mobile homes, right? We call them mobile homes. You'll hear us probably going back and forth, I just think out of habit, you know, between mobile homes or manufactured homes, but mobile homes are by and large not mobile. Um, most homes are never moved once they've been sited in a community, once they're installed, you know, footers are installed and they're, they're, the uh, utility lines are connected. Um, most of the homes are never moved for one reason or another. One of them being that it's difficult and expensive to move a mobile home, right? There's high insurance costs. Um, you have to install footers, uh, et cetera. I know uh, I've only had one case where I had a client that had any wherewithal to even think about moving a mobile home, and I think it cost them in the neighborhood of five to seven thousand to move it uh, all in. I think that's as I've asked around. I think that's kind of a ballpark figure, by and large, of what it might cost someone. Um, I mean, we're talking at least several thousands, perhaps all the way up to ten thousand, just to move the thing, um, and that's assuming that it's even mobile, right? So frames slacken, chassis degrade. Um, I know that. I kind of the joke uh, that I've heard uh, out there a lot, although I think there's a lot of truth to it, is that the vast majority of these cases, if you ask the, the owner, you know, what's your year make and model, you're going to hear it's a 1970 something, right? Uh, and if you think back to the flood that we had in the early 70s, I, I do believe that with a lot of folks that were displaced by the flood that had, to, I don't know any historical data on that, but um, I think that that played a, a good role in the introduction of a lot of manufactured housing across the state. Um, and so we do end up finding a lot of these 1970-something manufactured homes where, again, even if a person had the, uh, the economic wherewithal to be able to move them, they're just physically not mobile. Um, and then you might have you know, situations where decks or other things are built onto them that make it difficult for them to be able to move as well. So, um, you know, again, vernacular, what, what kind of terminology should we be using? You might have heard the term of trailers, right? We hear often trailers, trailer parks, mobile homes. 
uh, or manufactured housing. So the federal statute uh, utilizes the term manufactured housing, but the state statute refers to both manufactured and mobile homes. Um, keep in mind that the previous iteration of PA law on the subject was called the Mobile Home Park Rights Act. Um, and, and when they had made some recent amendments, um, the big one was to change the name of the act. But when they made some of those recent amendments, I think that, that they got lost in the shuffle there, this uh, change of terminology back and forth between mobile homes and manufactured homes. So you'll see both of those used. We tend to try to avoid the, the use of the term trailer. Uh, given the negative stereotyping associated with which most of you folks are likely already familiar. So evictions from manufacturing home communities and Dan, I'm not seeing the number. So on your end, if you just you chime in and let me know when it's time for me to hand off. Sorry, because I forget exactly what the numbers were. Um, sure, we'll figure it out. Yeah, the legal framework that we're working with here in the context of manufactured uh, housing, manufacturing home communities is two different things, right? So one, we all know and love the Landlord Tenant Act. Um, we also then have the Manufactured Home Community Rights Act. So MACRA um, is what I call MICRA, MACRA. Um, and, and understand that the legislature, uh, because of this unique scenario that's created where you have a person who owns a manufactured home and then installs it on a piece of property owned by somebody else, the legislature got together um, many moons ago and enacted a special set of law that applies to these manufactured home communities to take into account this unique legal situation that's created by um, just the notion of owning a mobile home and, and installing on land of another. Um, so, but both apply, right? We, have to, we keep in mind that both the Landlord Tenant Act and MACRA apply to these situations. Um, so purpose of MACRA. So there's, we don't have a whole lot of case law out there in the world of manufactured housing. The case law that we do have is pretty strongly worded um, in favor of tenants with, especially with regard to the purpose of MACRA. Um, so the two big cases, which will be in the materials, which haven't made it to the website yet, but will in the coming days. Um, the first big case is Malvern Courts. Um, there's a quotation there that this, you know, it's the purpose of MACRA is to give manufactured homeowners special protections against arbitrary evictions, unfair rules, and retaliation, amongst other things. Um, and then uh, later we had Staley versus Burrill, and this they they highlighted in there that. Um, the purpose of MACRA is to even the playing field, right? Community owners have far greater bargaining power than manufactured home owners, especially when you think of, um, you know, the, the kind of the typical manufactured home community resident um, and, and, you know, being you know, so low income, uh, perhaps less educated. Um, there's obviously a huge disparity in bargaining power there and the whole purpose of MACRA is to level that playing field. Uh, the applicability of macro, right? So I, we hit you with definitions. I think these are the most important definitions to pull out for our purposes. So the first thing is what's a manufactured home community? So a community is a site on which there are three or more manufactured home dwellings. So um, I like to think of this in the context, if you have like say a farm owner who installed one manufactured home on his farm, to house a farm worker during the, the you know, season, um, that is not going to fall under the auspices of MACRA because we need a site on which there are three or more dwellings. Another example I have really quickly, I had one a very creative um, park owner who was working with a very interesting lawyer uh, one time where he had somehow or another worked it out that he had essentially a park, but he had worked with the zoning office to um, to break down the park into 10 separate parcels of land. And so his argument then was that even though he had 10 manufactured homes and even though they were all operating as though they were a community, his argument was that MACRA didn't apply to him because technically they were 10 different sites as opposed to there being one site with 10 manufactured homes on it. So I hopefully you all won't run into that, but just keep that in mind. We need a community with three or more manufactured home dwellings. Um, the terms lessee and, rel and resident are related. Um, a lessee is a person who rents a space in a manufactured home community and is responsible for performance of the lease. Uh, and then in that same vein, a resident is an owner of a manufactured home who rents a space in a manufactured home community. It's essentially congruent to lessee. 
Um, the reason for distinguishing between the two is that a lessee and a resident, some folks will be purchasing the home from the owner, uh, whereas another party uh, or another party um, under a separate agreement while they're renting the lot. Um, but they are relatively interchangeable for our purposes. Um, and then interesting enough for our purposes, the term tenant is a person who rents a home in a manufactured home community from the manufactured home owner. Um, so they're renting both the home and the lot. And understand that MACRA does not apply to the scenario where the tenant is renting both the home and the lot, even if it's in the middle of a hundred home community. Um, I use myself as an example. I know it was my very first MACRA case ever. Um, I had a client come in with a, who was living in a mobile home, uh, was renting, and it was in the middle of this huge park in one of our rural counties. And I call up opposing counsel because they didn't comply with MACRA and I was ready to give him the business. And he politely kind of broke it down to me and said, you do realize that your, your client is renting both the home and the lot, right? And so MACRA doesn't apply. And so I had my balloon pop there very quickly on that one and the air shot out. And uh, uh, so just please, you know, keep that in mind. Don't make that same mistake. You might be in the middle of Joe's mobile home park with a thousand mobile homes, but if they're renting both the homey and the lot macro does not apply. It's just a landlord tenant uh, situation under the landlord tenant act as any other stick built home would be. And then Dan, uh, I think this was the yeah. handoff point, right? I'll let you jump in. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is one of my favorite subjects, um, rent to own agreements. And I think a lot of people are familiar with them in the context of, you know, traditional stick built housing uh, where a rent to own agreement could mean just about anything. It could mean a lease with a standard option agreement uh, at some point uh, to buy the home. It could mean that it's an installment contract uh, to purchase the home. You know, it really, a, a lot of things that it could mean. Uh, in the context of a mobile home, I think that it, there's a little bit more clarity because of the Motor Vehicle Sales Finance Act that is it very broadly defines what a financing agreement is for a vehicle. And a mobile home is considered a vehicle under the act. Um, and so it, it tries to prevent the seller financer from using any sort of means to get, a, get out of, um, of the requirements of the act by titling or, or wording the finance agreement in, in such a way that they could say it's a lease or something like that. So when you see a situation where the tenant has a rent to own agreement for the trailer, and then there's a separate agreement where they pay lot rent for the land, um, I, I very clearly believe that that is, um, a, is, is a traditional mobile home park macro covered situation where um, the resident of the mobile home park is on the one hand purchasing the home via a finance agreement, however it's worded, rent to own or otherwise, and then is separately renting the lot. So just a heads up that if someone is trying to dispossess a resident of the home saying you know, that they're going to evict them under this rent to own agreement from the home, that that is not a landlord tenant relationship. Uh, and it's not a, uh, an eviction action. That should be an action in replevin or rep repossession of some sort. Um, and is, is separate from what we're going to talk about today, which is straight up evictions. Um, it's a confusing and, and can be slightly tricky. Um, but I think it mostly comes up in this context where uh, the client has somehow, you know, is, is in the home, but is, is purchasing it often from the owner of the park through this rent to own agreement, and then has breached the agreement for the lot in some way. Um, and remember that when you represent a client like that, you're defending on the eviction, but that's separate from their agreement to purchase the mobile home. And so if they do end up getting evicted, um, that, that leaves up in the air how you resolve what they have paid for this mobile home. You know, do they have an opportunity to sell their interest in it? Um, should they get the money back, uh, et cetera? So 
just a heads up on that tricky situation. And, and one other quick note there, Dan, to bring back the notion of themes that I talked about before. So again, keeping in mind that this is not real property. If any of you have been part of any of the rent to own sessions over the last several years, you know that usually when we're talking about traditional stick built housing and we're talking about uh, you know deeds being involved, et cetera, as soon as we hear the term rent to own, usually the first thing that we're trying to do is ascertain exactly what's going on with that agreement. Is it really just a lease where the MDJ does still have jurisdiction? or has a uh, title to that real property been called into question where we could argue that the MDJ lacks jurisdiction. In this situation, as Dan had mentioned, if we are uh, dealing with a rent to own separate from a lot agreement, if there's a default on the lot agreement, again, this is just, you know, it's not real property. So those same kind of arguments about the MDJ lacking jurisdiction would not come into play if we're just simply talking about the lot end of things. Those, any of those kind of arguments would only come up in the context of dealing with the rent to own agreement itself. Yeah, and I'll give a shout out to um, affirmative litigation here. I, I don't see this very often in my own work where uh, the individual is financing the purchase of the home either a new or used mobile home through a traditional um, third party finance company. Um, so not the owner of the park. Uh, I don't see it a lot, I think, because my clients really don't get into that, ha have the means to get into financing stuff. But um, it does happen. It's, it's pretty common um, in, in, a, in mobile home purchasing. And there is this act that has very specific requirements as to what happens in a default in that financing agreement. Um, and I know CJP and other consumer protection law firms around the state, you know, are interested in reviewing those cases to make sure that if a repossession happens, it was done properly. Uh, just FYI. Um, all right. So a big thing about the manufactured how, um, home community rights act, MICRA, is that there is a no waiver of rights clause. So that makes litigating these landlord tenant cases slightly easier than a traditional landlord tenant case, because you know that the rights we're going to talk about um, going forward uh, cannot be waived by the written lease. Um, unlike in landlord tenant, traditional landlord tenant cases where, you know, that's a lot more unclear. Uh, so you'll see section 12 specifically says um, that they may not be waived by any provision of a written or oral agreement um, and that such agreements are void and unenforceable. Uh, there is a, a, a outstanding question as whether that language in the MICRA extends to rights that, you know, traditional rights of tenants or consumers um, that are not speci specifically enumerated in the statute itself. Uh, you know, for instance, we've had a discussion on the state landlord tenant listserv about waiving your right to an appeal from the magistrate to the court of common pleas. Um, in a mobile home context, would any clause like that be uh, void and unenforceable because of the language of MICRA that says um, may not be waived by any provision? Um, I mean, it's it's pretty broad general language. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's contained within this statute. So uh, something to explore if you're in that situation. All right, another thing that makes it a little bit more clear is that the statute specifically prohibits self-help evictions. Uh, a leasee shall not be evicted by any self-help measure, period. Uh, section 3B1. So um, that that's very helpful. You don't have to go searching for those uh, Court of Common Pleas uh, cases that we all use to back up our claim that self-help is illegal in this state. Um, on the other hand, one question that comes up in this context, perhaps more than any other, is the legality of a landlord or a park owner terminating utility service to the, um, to the resident. And the reason it's slightly different in the mobile home context is because in the mobile home context, often the landlord or, or park owner is providing the utility service themselves. For instance, they have a sewer treatment pond. And so the, all, the, all the wastewater is treated um, at the owner's expense. Um, or they have a well 
that they're using to provide water to the residents. And so the water is provided at the owner's expense. And the owner is charging separately for the utility use. Um, and so they feel, you know, I, I, I find this quite often that the owner feels if they don't get paid for the utilities, which usually is in conjunction with not getting paid the rent, that they have the right to terminate your utility like a, um, you know, public utility or a municipal authority would have the right to do. I strongly believe that they do not, that that is part of the um, package of renting and that it's a violation of self-help and of the, ha you know, warranty of habitability if they do that. But I will caution people that across the state, um, judges are not as clear in their um, understanding of, of self-help being illegal in that context. Dan, if right. I could interrupt, please, I'm sorry. This is Kelly. I'm launching the first of the CLE question poll boxes. You'll have about a minute and a half to respond. And Dan, please feel free to continue. Thank you. Okay. That's a good, good uh, point to interrupt because it brings us to uh, the grounds for eviction. And they're actually specifically stated in the statute um, that the only grounds for eviction are non-payment of rent, a second or subsequent violation of the rules of the manufactured home community occurring within six months. Um, and then if there's a change in the use of the community or a termination of the or park closure. Uh, let's see here. So first of all, big heads up here, okay. Uh, it's very clear from the statute and then also from the Landlord Tenant Act, which was amended, um, that end of lease term is not a grounds for eviction. So you can think of mobile home park uh, residencies or, or tenancies as being very similar to a subsidized housing uh, lease where um, it's perpetual, that you cannot lose or be evicted from the park uh, because your lease comes to an end. There has to be one of those um, reasons I previously stated. And you'll see that um, that there's some old case law out there that had, I think, wrongly interpreted MICRA uh, to say that, no, you could end the lease, um, but that's been overruled. And I, I cite one of the cases down there um, that was overruled, just so you're not confused when you go to look at the case law. Um, the, you know, MICRA and the Landlord-Tenant Act in Section 501C.1 make very clear that you cannot uh, terminate a lease for end of lease term. I'll also mention this very quickly, um, as, as stated in the list of grounds for eviction, park closure or change of use is one of those four grounds, or two of those four grounds. Um, and that's a fairly rare situation, uh, but it does come up. Uh, and when it comes up, the act actually regulates how a park is to be closed and what the residents at the time of closure are entitled to. They get a six months advance notice before the park can be closed and they're entitled to relocation costs up to uh, $4,312 um, for a single wide or for a double wide, or if they choose on their own to abandon the mobile home, leave it behind. They're allowed to do that. Uh, it doesn't cost them anything to leave the mobile home behind. And they are to be paid by the park owner who's closing the park, either $2,500 or the actual value of the mobile home based on an appraisal, uh, whichever is, um, actually this should say whatever is greater. It says whichever is less, but uh, it, the, owner of the mobile home, the resident who is losing that home uh, because of park closure is entitled to some good compensation with at least 2,500 coming to their pocket. So if you end up in a situation where your client's being evicted because the park is closing, uh, definitely call CJP. We're very interested in helping residents um, understand their rights and get what they're entitled to. Um, we can help your program uh, work with that 
group of, of residents. Um, PHFA is required under the act to be notified of any park closure, and then uh, they notify us. Um, your program can also sign up for notifications if you'd like that. So I, I won't dwell much more on, on grounds for eviction when there's a closure, if it's properly closed, they can go through the eviction process at the end of that six months and have you evicted for that reason. But there's pretty a, a stiff barrier um, before they can just say the park is closed. All right, so of course there's non-payment of rent as one of the sp specific grounds for eviction. Um, and you know that's to be expected. So how do you challenge that in a mobile home context? Uh, first of all, the statute says some, some very specific things about how the rent can be charged. Unfortunately, one of those is not how much they can charge for rent. There's no rent control in Pennsylvania when it comes to mobile home parks. Uh, there are, uh, in other uh, states, uh, mobile home park laws that do regulate how much can be charged, how much rents can be raised. But in Pennsylvania, there is no regulation of how much rent can be raised. But there are other restrictions. For instance, rents have to be uniform for all tenants. Um, for a similar property. So if the lot is for single wides, um, you know, across the park, they all have to be paying the same lot rent. You can't say that residents who have been there longer get to pay less um, than new residents. You can't say, you know, I don't, I don't like you or you didn't bargain with me as well, so you're going to pay more. Um, they all have to be uniform. Now, if you had a double wide lot, then that would be different than a single wide lot. So there could be a difference in rent for that if the park owner so chose. Uh, rent can only be increased once a year. So you have to make sure that they're not increasing the rent um, more frequently than that. That can be uh, a means to challenge how much rent is owed. Um, and then also- Dan, if I can real quick, I'll jump yeah. in on a couple of things before we get to the notice. Um, one is, I think by and large, you're gonna, you'll find that uh, leases for uh, mobile manufactured home communities and lots are month on a month to month basis, I think is pretty much the standard. I don't know if I've ever seen a lease in a manufactured home community for more than month to month. And I think that's in large part because of this notion of the landlord wanting or the park owner wanting the ability to be able to increase the rent based on the notice that they provide and not being locked into a lengthy lease term. So I think by and large, we see month to month leases. Um, the second thing here to note is uh, Don Merritt's raised a good point that I wanna hit in the chat here, um, that rent is defined by the statute as rent for the lot space. So understand we, we've seen probably in some private housing scenarios where you'll have leases attempt to call, you know, non-payment of utilities as quote rent so that when they go and file with the, the MDJ, they can call it all as being rent owed um, or some other like maybe maintenance charges or some other fees. But under MACRA, it is clear that rent is defined as solely the lot rent. So if you do have non-payment of some uh, other debt, right? So, you know, whether it be maintenance charges or what have you, um, that's not grounds for eviction for non-payment of rent. Thanks. No problem, thank you. Um, so another uh, area where the rent is regulated to a certain extent is uh, there's a notice required before rent can be raised. And there's, a, there's some confusion on what the statute requires in terms of a time period. Um, my reading of the statute is that it requires a 60 day notice before rent can be raised. Um, and, I, and that's based on section 13E, uh, just a heads up, for those of you who are gonna delve into reviewing the statute when you get a case like this, section 13 is titled damages, but tucked into that section because it's a fairly new section is uh, subpart E that talks about um, notice when a lease is, when a new lease is entered or a lease is renewed or extended. And my, and it's, it flat out says you cannot charge uh, rent until 61 days after the notice is provided. Um, and my, you know, my reading and understanding of the law is if you have a lease that has rent at one amount and you increase the rent, then that is a new 
or a renewed uh, or extended lease. And therefore that triggers the 60 day requ notice requirement of section 13 E. But you will also see in an earlier section of the statute um, that the 30 day, there's a 30 day notice requirement of uh, to disclose any increases in fees or rent. Um, I, I read those as, as being uh, concurrent requirements that you have to give notice uh, of the increase and disclose it. Um, one requires 60 days and one requires 30 days. So um, it's a, it is a little confusing, but those, it gives you the context that when rents are raised and your client can't keep up with them, so they're behind on rent, uh, you need to look to see when they were raised, what notice was given, um, et cetera, so that you can get an understanding of whether there's any grounds to challenge the amount of rent owed. And then real, real quick, Dean, I, Eileen had chimed in with a question here that I want to just hit on while I'm thinking about it. So, yeah, so uh, the question then is like, so would there be no grounds to evict somebody then for non-payment of the other contractual obligations? And I think um, the answer to that is no, I think there, there definitely would be an ability to evict. It just wouldn't be on the basis of non-payment of rent. It'd have to be one of those other breaches of the lease. Yeah, well, you know, in this slide here that I just jumped to, uh, the pay and stay is still, um, you know, very much uh, a part of a, an eviction in mobile home parks. So uh, under being able to reduce the amount of rent owed, uh, even if it's not eliminating the entire obligation is very important. Um, all right. I hope that answered Eileen's question because I'll be honest, I didn't quite catch exactly what it was. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, all right, another thing, of course, is when you're thinking about um, non-payment of rent, it, that a very common defense is the implied warranty of habitability being breached by the land own, landlord or the park owner. Uh, and it is important to know that that implied warranty has been extended to residents of mobile home parks. There's a 1998 Supreme Court case, Daly v. Burrell, that makes that very clear. It uses some very good language. Um, and so it, it's a slightly different understanding of the implied warranty because remember, if you own the mobile home and you're just renting the lot, the mobile home is clearly the resident's responsibility. Uh, you know, they have to maintain that home. That's why um, it's a lot cheaper uh, or there's a lot less expense for a park owner um, in renting the the, the the lots uh, than it is for an apartment owner. owner. Um, but if the park owner has made improvements to the mobile home park so that people will rent the lots, then the park owner is responsible for maintaining those improvements. So we're talking about roads, right, to get to the lots. We're talking about um, gas lines, sewer lines, water lines um, that are used to get to uh, you know, that, are, that go to the park. Um, those are, you know, trees that are on, on the lot um, that could be dangerous, maybe need to be removed. Those are things that the owner is responsible for. Um, and there is an implied warranty of habitability that they must maintain those. You see a lot of um, park owners trying to push off that responsibility onto the resident. Uh, and it makes sense because frankly, these park owners see the their responsibility as being as limited as possible. They want to, you know, they do not want to take on any of the expense of maintaining uh, the the lot and the, and anything else because uh, they see these as cash cows essentially. Um, unlike you know uh, a regular apartment where it's clear that the owner you know has to keep up that investment. Um, so be, be very aware that you can use that implied warranty of habitability as a defense, just like you would in any other landlord tenant scenario. All right, so besides um, non-payment of rent, the other uh, important uh, grounds for eviction that is specifically stated in the statute is uh, another breach of the lease. So a breach of the conditions of the lease. Um, and the first thing you have to uh, do when you're 
trying to analyze whether this is grounds for eviction is look at the term of the, the lease or the, the term in the rules and regulations for the park. The statute requires that those uh, terms be fair and reasonable, uh, be reasonably related to health, safety, and the upkeep of the community, and they cannot be arbitrary or capricious, and they have to be in writing. Um, now, those are pretty vague legal words. What do they mean? Um, that'll be uh, left for you to, to argue, um, and there's not really any case law to help define those words in the context of the mobile home eviction and whether a particular clause of the lease or rules and regulations is uh, enforceable. But that, that's the basic context in which you have to challenge those rules. Um, another thing that's specifically stated in the act is that the, the rules have to be uniform, they have to apply to everyone. And if they're not enforced uniformly against all residents, then it can't be a grounds for eviction. So that comes up, I guess I'll give a quick example would be, you know, you're being evicted because you have a swimming pool uh, and that's in the lease, you can't have swimming pools, but you know, there's a neighbor who's close to the manager who still has a swimming pool and is not being evicted. That's clearly um, unequal enforcement and the statute is specific that you cannot be evicted for unequal enforcement. And then I'll just remind everybody of uh, you know, the requirement that a breach of the lease be material in order for it to be grounds for eviction. There's no reason that um, concept does not apply to mobile home parks like it does uh, to uh, renters in apartment buildings and et cetera. And then another heads up that the Fair Housing Act still applies. So that defense that we often use in traditional apartment uh, rental situations also applies in mobile home park evictions. Uh, is there a reason related to the disability that the resident is unable to meet the specific term of the, the lease or the rules and regulations that they're being evicted for? And can you craft a reasonable accommodation um, to you know, ensure that they uh, can remain in the park? All right. Uh, I think I'm, yeah. I'm back in, right? Yes. Okay. I'm begging back in. All right. So now we want to talk about some technical defenses under MACRA. And, and so we'd say technical, you know, we mean like procedural arguments, right? So obviously not getting into substantive issues, but just trying to look at something procedural. And especially we go back to, again, keeping in mind Malvern Courts, where uh, Malvern Court says um, that strict compliance with the act is required. And so that gives us some pretty strong language. Um, to argue uh, failure to comply on the park owner's part with all of the different notice requirements, which as we're gonna talk about here and you're gonna see are different than our standard um, Landlord Tenant Act uh, cases that we typically encounter. So first thing with notice to quit, it must be in writing. It must be sent via certified or registered mail, right? With that's a departure, right? We're used to under the Landlord Tenant Act, just simply thinking of hand delivery or posting at the property, but here, um, one of the major departures in the macro cases is this, these notices being sent by certified or registered mail, and it must be sent prior to the filing of the eviction. I know we, Dan and I have been talking recently about there's not a whole lot of strong case law out there that stands for the proposition in a regular landlord tenant scenario that, um, that the notice has to have necessarily run before the landlord files. I know we've got some judges that like to take the position that it's okay for the landlord to file any, you know, so long as the eviction doesn't occur before the end of the notice. But here it's clear under MACRA that it must be sent prior and it must run prior to the filing of the eviction. Um, and note here again, there's the, the quote from Malvern, strict compliance with notice requirements is required. So again, keeping in mind to me, I think I keep in my mind this theme or this notion of there's all these special protections that the legislature's built in for individuals who own manufactured homes and rent the lots. And so in keeping with that notion of trying to provide these special protections, it requires the park owner to strictly comply with all of the different requirements of MACRA before he or she or it brings a case. Um, notice to quit. Now, another, again, departure here. I, as I understand, I think in the older, you know, former iterations of 
the landlord tenant act there may have been some provisions for summer notices versus winter notices or summer evictions versus winter evictions of course we know now that you know the landlord tenant act doesn't have those same um, changes or those same alterations uh, it's just uh, one process across the board um, but here uh, in under macro we've got summer notices for non-payment of rent provide 20 days to pay if we're talking April 1 through August 31. And then over the winter months, there's 30 days to pay uh, when we're talking September 1 through March 31. So there is a differentiation under MACRA between summer months and winter months. Um, one thing I should note that I skipped over on the last slide, Dan, I, I want to just highlight is, again, keeping in mind what Dan had mentioned earlier, that it specifically states in MACRA that um, any of the provisions that provide tenants' rights cannot be waived, right? So when we're talking notice to quit, we have to keep in mind under the Landlord-Tenant Act, we know that the notice can be waived. When we're talking MACRA, because of that um, no waiver of rights provision, a, a MACRA uh, resident, a uh, mobile home resident, cannot waive his or her right to receive notice to quit uh, under the Act. So yes, so we talked summer and yep. And so now notices for other breach of the lease. So the notice must describe the particular breach or violation. I have a rhetorical question there, like, you know, do we think a like a quote unquote checklist is enough, right? If the landlord or the park owner just has a checklist of, you know, five things and, and you know it says unauthorized occupants and they put a check in the checkbox, is that enough of a particular uh, description of the violation? And I know for for those of us who've defended. Um, subsidized housing cases, we know that's an issue that comes up with some regularity is this notion of subsidized housing providers providing um, particular notice of the breaches that are alleged. Um, so that's a, a something to look at. I know that's an argument I've made probably at least a couple of times over the years, these kind of blanket checklists that don't give any particularity at all. We can try to argue that it violates due process by not giving us sufficient notice to be able to prepare a defense to go to uh, the MDJ hearing and make an argument. Um, so eviction, and again, we're going to hit on this in a second here. We talked about it earlier. Bring it up again. Eviction may occur only if there is a second or subsequent breach within a six-month time frame, um, which I'll put off until the next couple of slides. And then eviction proceedings must be commenced within 60 days of the issuance of, or I'm sorry, of the last violation or breach. So there's going to be a case that we're going to talk about later from out of Allegheny County. Um, that stands for this proposition that, that it requires a filing within 60 days from the last violation or breach. So if you have a stale notice, um, we do have a good argument to be made here under macro that the case should be dismissed if the notice is stale. Now that takes into what does second or subsequent breach mean? So I think for me in the context of macro cases, I think this is one of the two major areas of discrepancy where um, it's still arguable. There's no case law that tells us clearly. And, it, and this is one of the two major areas where the arguments arise out of uh, seemingly the most. Um, what does second or subsequent breach mean? So the unresolved question in that language is, does it mean that it has the breach has to be the exact same breach, right? So, you know, your skirting fell off, uh, you know, in January. Um, and you, you know, took some time to repair it, and then your skirting fell off again in March, and you took some time to repair it. Does that have to be the same exact breach as was noted in the first notice, or can it be any breach, right? If you breach by having the skirting fall off in January, and then you don't cut your grass uh, in March, and those are two separate breaches, is that enough within a six-month time frame to warrant there being an eviction? Um, we have a Depratus case uh, from out of Allegheny County. This is Judge Wedick, for those of you who are familiar. Um, Judge Wedick was deciding three major issues, um, one of them being the second or subsequent, and he fell on the side of it being essentially in the landlord's favor that it can be any breach um, within that, that second or subsequent can be any breach within six month time frame. On our end, I think that we should be arguing as much as it makes sense to argue it that it should be the same breach, right? Um, and I go back to this notion of, you know, again, uh, providing as many protections as possible to folks and understanding that, you know, if they're evicted, they're not going to only be evicted from the, the lot in the mobile home uh, and perhaps be made homeless, but then they are quite possibly going to lose the mobile home as well, um, which we may get to if we have time. Um, and so I think we should be arguing that it should be the same breach. Um, the pushback that you're likely to receive on that, and I know from what I've heard 
um, from judges and other attorneys is their argument is, does that mean then that the tenant can just simply go through all, you know, 25 provisions of the lease and decide to breach each one, you know, month by month um, and never be evicted because they didn't technically um, breach the same condition um, or commit the same breach um, within a six month time frame. There's obviously a line somewhere. I think if you have a sympathetic case where, you know, again, I, I use the, an, like an elderly, you know, a tenant example, you got an elderly tenant who the skirting falls off and then a couple months later, they don't mow their grass appropriately. Like, should that be enough to warrant uh, term, you know, at least termination and eviction and then potentially the loss of a home. So keep that in mind. I think that's a good argument for us to be making when we think we can, can get in there and make it. Um, the second major issue that we're gonna run into is do, do the Landlord Tenant Act notice to quit requirements apply in addition to the macro requirements, right? So we talked about the macro requirements a bit. Um, the Landlord Tenant Act specifically speaks to notice to quit for mobile home park tenants, right? There's the, the section 42501C. Um, now, I'm gonna mention here, and I'm gonna come back to it on the next slide. Notice to quit under the Landlord Tenant Act is unconditional. If you look at the language of the act, it says that eviction shall commence. Um, under MACRA, the language is eviction may commence if uh, you don't pay your rent or if you commit this second breach or su subsequent breach within six months. It's a conditional notice. I'm gonna come back to why I think that's important here in the next slide. The timelines are different though under the Landlord Tenant Act. For non-payment of rent, it's 15 days for the summer and then it's 30 days for the winter. For other breaches, it's just a flat 30 days across the board. Um, there is a different service requirement, right? Again, as we're used to either personal service or posting on the property. But the question we're gonna encounter is, um, when you run into this scenario, sh does the park owner merely have to provide the macro notices and that's enough? Or do they also have to provide the Landlord Tenant Act notices in addition to the macro notices? I think that's still up for debate and argument. Our next slide here that uh, Dan's gonna take us to, um, I'm gonna give you the back and forth on that. So the first thing, is the Depredis case. Again, this was the second major issue that Judge Wettick um, tackled. Um, and in his uh, opinion, um, in that case, he determined that the macro notices were all that was required. And I think if I recall, his justification was that, you know, macro was this separate special statute that the legislature got together and enacted um, after the Landlord Tenant Act. And they put in this very specific language about certified notices, et cetera. And so he felt, uh, in his opinion, that that rose to the level of um, providing all these additional protections and, and, and enough protections for tenants that the Landlord Tenant Act notices were not also required. So that was his holding um, in that case. Now, I will say though, on our end, a big but, I think we've got three really solid arguments here that would lend to um, the notion that the Landlord Tenant Act notices are required on top of the macro notices. One, again, considering purpose, right? Um, the purpose is to provide these special protections. And so that lends to an, our argument for as much notice as possible. Um, another one, which was raised actually by one of our local MDJs here in Dauphin County, and I have since stolen it from him because I think it's a great argument, um, is if you look in the judicial code under their jurisdiction section, MDJs only have jurisdiction over disputes arising under the Landlord Tenant Act, but the code is silent as to disputes arising under the Manufactured Home Community Rights Act. So the judge in, uh, in um, a memo that he had written up, um, you know, his position, which I like a lot because it helps our cause, right? Um, his position is that, you know, in order for a park owner to vest the MDJ with jurisdiction to hear a dispute between the park owner and the park resident, they have to not only give the macro notices to comply with macro, but they've also got to give the Landlord Tenant Act notices so that they can then vest the court with jurisdiction to hear any dispute. Um, the third argument then is uh, going back to what I just mentioned in the previous slide, the macro notice being conditional alone, there is case law that supports that a conditional notice of breach alone is not sufficient to terminate a leasehold interest. I don't know if it was you, Don Merritts, that pulled the Brown case, or if it was Bob Damewood. I, I know I stole it from one of you guys, but this Brown case from 1949 was a, a, a situation as a regular landlord-tenant case, um, not macro, of course, but um, but it was a situation where the landlord gave a conditional notice and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said you can't terminate a leasehold interest based on a merely conditional notice. You have to provide this unconditional notice. So again, that gets us back to requiring a Landlord Tenant Act notice with that unconditional language. 
and I, we're gonna have to try to breeze through here. So Dan, I, I don't know how many we can get to in the last couple of minutes here before we get cut off, but I know I'll let you take it over. Yeah, oh, wow, okay. Well, thanks, that's really important stuff about the notice to quit. Um, and I'll just say the other technical requirement uh, that might be created uh, by the act is these disclosures. Throughout the act, there's a requirements that the landlord must make. And if they don't make them, does that mean they can't evict for uh, whatever uh, you know um, issue that wasn't disclosed? So I'll just go over the general disclosures really quickly. Um, the rules and regulations must be posted publicly in the park. Uh, the rules and regulations must be provided to each tenant before first payment is accepted. Um, the statute, MICRA, has to be posted publicly in the park. And there's a general disclosure statement, uh, the specific language of which is, is too long here to cite, but it's entitled Important Notice Required by Law, and it must be given to every resident. Um, and it talks about things like your right, um, you know, for how you could be evicted and things like that. Then there's what I call the disclosure requirements for rent and fees. And these are additional disclosure requirements specific to rent and fees. Um, first, it says that all rents and fees must be fully disclosed in writing. Not sure exactly how far you can take fully disclosed. For instance, if it says you have to pay for water, is that fully disclosing when it doesn't tell you how they'll charge you for water? Um, you know, that especially if water is provided by a well uh, that the landlord owns, um, it, it doesn't seem very clear how uh, expensive that service would be, that fee for that service would be. Um, disclosure must be posted publicly in the park. Okay, again, it needs to be posted publicly uh, and it needs to be mailed to each resident at least 30 days in advance. Um, and then there's a separate fee disclosure statement specific to fees. Uh, it's a much shorter disclosure and it talks about, you know, again, your rights um, uh, about, uh, you know, fee increases. And this comes with, this is said to be a cover sheet uh, for any, uh, you know, for the full disclosure um, on the fees and, and rents. So again, what happens if you don't receive these? Well, the statute's a little more clear when it comes to not receiving disclosures regarding rent and fees. Section six says, quote, shall render them void and unenforceable in the courts of the Commonwealth, end quote. I think that makes it very clear that if you can prove the disclosures were not followed precisely, that the landlord cannot recover that monetary claim in court. So I think you can um, bar, uh, or defend against the monetary challenge, you know, claim that the landlord brings in an eviction case for those claims. Uh, whether you can carry it over to preventing the eviction, uh, maybe a little less clear. Um, section 13 also says uh, that a first time leasee may void the lease within the first year and until five days after disclosures are received. Uh, if you read that sentence, you can read it a million times. I, I can't make sense of exactly what it means, uh, but it seems to suggest that the for uh, someone within their first year uh, who doesn't get the disclosures can void the the lease and walk away. Um, does that mean that they that other residents who aren't who don't receive the disclosures, um, you know? can't challenge them, I, I would refer back to section six and it's very specific language about um, being unenforceable in the courts of the Commonwealth. Uh, but that does leave open this question of if you don't receive the general disclosures, for instance, say the statute is not posted in the park or say the important notice isn't provided to the residents um, before they enter into a lease, does that mean that the landlord cannot pursue eviction? Um, I, I would say that it does because, again, there's that case out there in Melbourne courts that says strict compliance with what the statute, what the legislature required. Um, but uh, when it comes to notice to quit, that's specifically in the statute. It says you shall not evict unless you follow these procedures, whereas the general disclosures, it just says you have to make these disclosures, and it's not clear what the consequence of failing to make those disclosures would be. 
Dan, um, if I could just if I could just interrupt quick. This is Kelly. I'm launching the second CLE poll box. Dan, please continue. Thank you. Okay. Um, retaliatory evictions, just a, a quick heads up that those are prohibited and there is a uh, presumption that an eviction is retaliatory if it's within six months of the um, of the resident asserting their rights. Okay, um, do we have time here? <laughs> Might as well just keep going while people are filling out their poll. Um, there's a very Im uh, important uh, bookend to evictions when it comes to mobile homes. It, and that is because once you're evicted from the lot, often you don't move your mobile home when the constable shows up and evicts you. Uh, it can't be moved or you don't have the ability to put that all together and get it done right away. So you still have to deal with the mobile home, the personal property that's left behind. And that's often someone's most valuable asset in their life. Um, so how do you make sure that your client can recover their value, not lose everything? Um, you know, I'll just point out some general principles uh, that you know the eviction does not apply to the mobile home itself. Doesn't mean the landlord gets possession of the mobile home, uh, just the lot. Uh, the mobile home just happens to be personal property left behind. Um, that the 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 tenant, although the law is unclear here, the tenant should have the right to return to the lot during reasonable hours to make repairs to the home, to winterize it, to prepare it for sale, and to ultimately sell it or move it. Um, but the, the statute doesn't really deal with that scenario. Um, so what the statute does offer, go ahead, Matt. I say, Dan, and it, it does, I mean, practically it does create a very kind of unique, interesting, and just weird situation, right? Because you have this mobile home that's owned by the, the one person um, and they've been told that they're not allowed to live on the lot. And so um, I know that practically speaking, it does get difficult sometimes as to like, what should the park owner do or not do with regard to allowing the tenant the ability to come back onto the lot? Because naturally they have to get back onto the lot in order to be able to do whatever it is they need to do with the mobile home, like Dan mentioned. Um, right. But what is the park owner's rights there? Like, can the park owner um, put a lock on the door and only allow the tenant in whenever the tenant kind of, you know, arranges it in advance for some maintenance guy from the park to come out and open the lock. Um, I don't know the answer to that necessarily. I know it, it kind of, it, it's, I think it's going to vary from place to place, maybe park to park, perhaps. Um, I know that we, uh, you know, certainly are, want to take a position that the tenants should certainly have liberal leave to be able to come and go as they need. Um, but I, I do, if I'm, uh, you know, a little bit more on the conservative end here. I do also recognize that there's that possibility. I think we might have even had a case or two where the the park owner lets the 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 um, homeowner in to do something, and then the homeowner basically sets shop sets up shop again to to move back in because they don't have anywhere else to go. And so it is a very unique situation. Um, something that I think if you do encounter that, I think it's mostly just kind of reach out to to the group, and we'll we'll try to deal with it as it comes up, case by case. Well, we do need to try to deal with it because to me, this is the wild, wild west of mobile home park evictions. What happens after the eviction? You've got anything from padlocking the person's door um, to doing nothing to, you know, posting the property saying that you're going to be considered a criminal trespasser if you come. Uh, so it, it's a very unclear situation under the law. Um, but again, it's often the, the tenant who's been evicted. It's often their most valuable asset and losing that completely can be damaging. Um, I'll point out that there is a process under the statute for the landlord to um, declare the property abandoned. And ultimately um, that provides them the right to secure the property, um, have the utilities terminated and move it, and also to eventually sell or destroy it. Um, the abandonment process is a, is a court process or it's a, it's a, a voluntary written uh, statement by the owner of the mobile home. So it's very clear proceeding under the statute as to how the owner goes about ha even having the right to secure the, the property or terminate the utilities or sell or destroy the home. Um, so I, you know, I think in that context, since the statute is so clear about how the owner can go about doing that, that if the owner doesn't follow those, I think that would be illegal. Um, but it also gives an opportunity here for 
a tenant who can't move the, the mobile home and can't find a buyer for it quickly to negotiate with the landlord to turn it over to the landlord um, without forcing the landlord to go through this uh, procedure. Uh, the landlord um, you know, can usually turn a mobile home into a, a handsome profit. So keep that in mind that you shouldn't undersell in the, um, the mobile home that you'd be transferring to the uh, landlord. And then also just a heads up that since it's personal property, if the landlord got a monetary judgment as part of the eviction or otherwise, they can um, you know, levy on that mobile home. But uh, if the mobile home's worth anything, then it, and, and the judgment isn't too significant, it's probably over levied. So you should consider challenging that levy uh, so that the tenant isn't prevented from selling the mobile home or moving it. Um, and you know that you know that's another area where we can get involved to yeah, to really I'll, help I'll, someone I'll, save their assets. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll make a quick shout out to Kelly Kramer, who's on the, who's listening here. I think she had a case in Lebanon County where this very thing came up here. I don't know several months back now. It was something honestly. I, I think I might have heard it once before, but I, I lose concept of the notion that there is a, a process in the the MDJ rules that allows for the landlord to execute on a judgment at the MDJ's office through the constable. I think I, I was, you know, typically we see executions go through common pleas and sheriffs and, you know, garnishing wages or sheriff sales, but there is a process by which they can levy property at the MDJ. And then, you know, as Dan mentioned there, um, you know, it, it can be utilized to, to try to hold up um, the homeowner's ability to, to transfer the property in one form or another, but just know that they're, is a process and a means by which to challenge that. There's our contact information if you need anything else from us. Otherwise, we've held you 10 minutes long. We apologize. Um, and Kelly, at this point, I don't I'll know. I'll stay on to take more questions. Yeah, certainly, I'll be on to take to. questions. I don't know, Kelly, how you want to roll it if you if you want to try to get into questions now or? Well, sure, help yourselves, guys. Ran too late. Okay, so Dan, I'll, kind of, I'll try to run through them here in the chat. So I see, so the first one was uh, on property tax. Um, uh, Eileen had mentioned, please explain why there's a property tax imposed on the home um, other than just simply money and our RVs, like, you know, recreational vehicles similarly taxed, which I'm going to throw to you if that's all right, because you probably know that better than I do. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I was typing something. What was the no, question? Right, yeah, please explain why there's a property tax imposed on the, at the mobile home and then our RVs similarly taxed, recreational vehicles similarly taxed. Our fees are not similarly taxed. And the reason that mobile homes are taxed is because the statute says that. Um, I guess the policy objective behind that is for anyone uh, to delve into the, the legislative history on that statute. But I, I, I think it's because in these smaller school districts or you know, these more rural areas, um, a lot of people live in these mobile home parks and they wanted a way to get some cash from them. Well, and I may be talking out of school a little bit here, Dan, because I don't really know exactly, but is, isn't it also tied to the improvement? Like, isn't there an, like the, the notion that the, the manufactured homes installed on the land and therefore improves the land? And so you get taxed on the improvement value that's like ostensibly created by the installation of the mobile home on the land? Well, the land itself is taxed too, and it's not supposed to be taxed based on the mobile homes. Um, it's supposed to be based at, you know, so they're separate. I mean, it's just totally confusing. And I think every uh, assessor's office and tax claim bureau that I've talked to um, hates it because they know it's really hard to collect on, to collect these taxes. And that it would be a lot easier to collect it from the park owner and just have the park owner responsible for, you know, raising the rent. But that's, um, you know, that's, that's not how uh, it's done. So we have to be mindful that our clients, you know, who don't pay their taxes um, could lose their home. I will say this, uh, that often no one buys a mobile home, particularly an old mobile home uh, at tax sale and the tax claim bureaus don't do much about it. So I have numerous clients and I think this is pretty common throughout the Commonwealth where the resident and owner of the mobile home uh, that has gone up for tax sale and not sold 
just stays there. And the taxes accrue year after year. And since no one ever wants to buy it, um, the person just lives there without paying their taxes. Um, so it's, it's not the most devastating scenario in that sense. But if you know, their, their asset has become severely encumbered by that, and if they were to sell it, they would have to pay that off. Part of uh, getting a new title, tra a title transferred via PennDOT is proof that the taxes have been paid. So uh, the real estate taxes. Um, so, you know, you're not going to be able to sell it. Uh, you know, whoever takes it over after you, um, you know, they're going to have to deal with this huge tax debt. So that could be a problem, but I don't, it, it often doesn't result in an immediate uh, issue. Although I am representing a client where one of these scumbags who buys, uh, you know, properties at tax sales real cheap. Uh, came, bought the house, bought the mobile home for four hundred and forty-six dollars, and then turned around and strong armed my client into giving them a check for ten thousand dollars to stay in their home. Lots of deception used, um, and just a total mess. But so, I mean, it, depending on how valuable the home is, uh, what where the park is located, uh, you could run into that situation. So you want to try to avoid that by having the the clients keep up on their taxes. Yeah, I, a real quick note on that is just, I, I think also keep in mind taxes if you are going to try to work out a deal where, I mean, something that we've done on a numerous occasions over the years, we have a situation where the tenants evicted for non-payment of rent, the mobile home's not mobile, so they have no intention of really doing anything with it. They probably don't have the wherewithal to figure out how to list it or sell it. So they're really just negotiating with the landlord on handing the, the home back over uh, and typically in exchange for the landlord park owner uh, marking the, the MDJ judgment as satisfied. Um, keep in mind taxes in that context too, that will creep into that conversation because uh, if a savvy park owner has any idea what they're doing, they're gonna want a, a, a check with, you know, they have to check in with the tax assessment office on that and they're gonna assume any liability there. So that's gonna factor into whatever the math yeah. is. Just, um, just to clarify um, the question, even if the RVs parked in a mobile home park, which has become common, uh, although I think there's a, a different zoning requirement uh, and permitting requirement for having RVs as opposed to mobile homes in your park. Um, but even if it's parked there and paying lot rent, it's not gonna be taxed because uh, recreational vehicles are defined differently by statute than mobile homes or manufactured homes are. Um, all right, but the, there's a question about retaliatory evictions. Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I was, if I started from the top, I know there was one about no. six months passed after the second rules violation. I think we answered that because that goes back to the 60 day rule. Um, so if six months passes after the second violation, no action is taken, then the park has waived its right to it. Actually, in the, in the Depredis case, the two major issues that Judge Wedick essentially ruled against the tenant on, um, the end result of the Depredis case was that the tenant actually prevailed because the landlord had waited, I think it was like 72 days or something from the date of the second violation. And so Judge uh, Wedick had found that they ultimately waived their right to bring that action because they waited too long. Um, yeah, to answer that question, you don't even have, it doesn't even have to be six months. It's 60 days. So you issue the first notice saying to the tenant, you violated the, the lease. Okay, we're going to evict you after a subsequent uh, uh, breach. And within that next six months, the tenant breaches again, right? Uh, the landlord has only 60 days to commence an eviction after that second breach. Otherwise, yes, they've waived their right to evict based on that second breach. Yeah. All right, sorry, Dan. So then that, yeah, then I think we're caught up then to retaliatory eviction talking points. Did yeah, I mean, I'm curious to see if this has been litigated much um, because I think it's difficult to prove retaliation. Um, You know, if you don't pay your rent and he evict and the landlord evicts for that, um, you know, that's going to get over any presumption of retaliation. Um, but it, the statute's, you know, helpful, unlike the landlord tenant statute, in that it, it says that um, retaliatory evictions are prohibited. Um, and there's sort of this six month presumption 
uh, that's created. If the tenant uh, asserts one of their rights under the act or any other legal right, um, that raises a presumption that an eviction is a retaliatory or unlawful eviction and violates the act if it's filed within six months of the tenant raising that. Um, to me, retaliatory evictions are not, I haven't seen that. What I fear more is retaliatory rent increases. Um, you know, if you want to challenge the cleanliness of the water or force the landlord to clean up the abandoned trailers, anything like that, uh, the landlord, if it's if they haven't raised the rent within a year, is free to to rocket the rent up whatever amount they want. And that to me is more chilling to residents than the threat of eviction is. Um, so uh, I'd like to see that statutorily changed. But um, but anyways, if, if people see a what they think is a retaliatory eviction, um, you know, I'd be more than willing to work with them on trying to develop that uh, legal concept if it has to go to appeal. I think we hit all the questions. Again, for anybody who stuck around, thanks for bearing with us. I will say again, I, I, I will um, sometime in the next couple of days, we'll have the PowerPoint as well as uh, the major cases that we discussed. I'll, I'll post them to the SCED app um, so that they can be accessed by, uh, I think anybody who had registered for the session. And beyond that, I think that's all that we have. Kelly, thanks, Dan. Yeah, just my last plug. If you see a park-wide issue and you need help addressing it, uh, CJP can, you know, can handle that case. Uh, we just settled a class action lawsuit against a park owner in Somerset County, uh, requiring the owner to um, fix some remaining leaks in the water system, install, install four shutoff valves throughout the park. So if they have to fix a future leak, they don't shut everyone off for it. Um, to enter into a contract to plow the snow at one and a half inches and to salt the roads um, in icy conditions, uh, set up a few uh, emergency contacts, and to freeze rent for um, a year or two and a half years uh, is, is compensation for some weeks that the residents went with poor to no water service during a massive leak. Um, so, you know, we're interested in these cases. They can be difficult, uh, but uh, I think now more than ever is the time to try to assert tenant rights. I've said that on some of these um, trainings before, but I think it's true. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Dan, for your time and for sharing all this great information. Thanks, everyone, for joining us and have a good rest of the day. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan.